Matthew Bailey. We sang two of my absolutely favorite hymns this morning, Be Thou My Vision and um, Amazing Grace. I didn't start today thinking that I was going to do this, but um, I feel inspired to do this. We'll see if this is a good idea or a bad idea. If you start throwing things at me, we'll know it's a bad idea. Um, ooh, that's not what we want. There is... That's not what we want either. There's a story about the writing of Amazing Grace um, that is a great story, except for the fact that it's, it's actually not true. Um, and it is the story, let me try this again. It's the story of um, the writer of Amazing Grace. And according to the story, the writer of Amazing Grace was a slave trader. That is true. And um, he had this moment aboard one of his slave trading trips on a ship where he encountered the grace of God. And in encountering the grace of God, he wrote Amazing Grace and immediately gave up his life of being a slave trader. Um, it's a good story. The problem is it actually kind of conflates a timeline. It is true that it was written by a slave trader, and it is true that on one of his ships he was overcome by the grace of God and wrote Amazing Grace. But it is not true that he immediately gave up being a slave trader. You think about the words we just sang. You think about the fact that he went back for quite a while to trading slaves and, um, and other things that we would consider really pretty abhorrent. But here's what's remarkable. And this is what I want us to catch because it's very important in today's passage. He did eventually give up being a slave trader because of the work of God's grace in his life. But it was a process that took time. And it was a process that involved in his life the repeated cycle of repenting of sin, trusting in Christ, and trying to be more like a follower of him. And we're going to look at the passage today, and it's going to sound in some ways like this is just automatic. There's an old way that you used to live, and there's a new way we're supposed to live, and you come to Christ, and it's supposed to just happen like that. But I, I hear a hymn like Amazing Grace, which truly may be one of my favorite hymns of all time, or maybe my favorite hymn of all time. And I'm reminded that even a man that God used to write those words it was a process in his life, and it took time. And one of the keys to that process is the other hymn that we sang, Be Thou My Vision. What do we set in front of us as our vision of what is good and beautiful and holy and right and what we desire? May God be that vision for each one of us. Well, what we're going to do now is we're going to spend some time actually looking in God's word. We do believe that this is God's word. We believe that when this was written, it was written for us in a way that is inspired by the Holy Spirit. And what we try to do each Sunday as we come together is we try to unpack. The Holy Spirit had a point he was trying to make in this passage. So what's the point he was trying to make and how is that point relevant to us? And that's exactly what we're going to do this morning. But before we do that, we have some work that we need to do. Uh, we need to ask the question, why that pin's not working? Who is this? Now, are we sure? Who is it really? Really? 
Peter Parker, as played by Tom Holland <laughs> in the movie, um, who's this? But who is it really? Bruce Wayne dressed up. One more. Superman, but who is it really? Christopher, now there is someone who I can respect. When old school Christopher Reeves. Trick question. He, that is his real identity. Clark Kent is the costume. Remember, Superman is the friendliest alien this side of E.T. And Clark Kent is how he disguised himself. Now, here's what I think is funny. A lot of us, when we think about the Christian life, we tend to make very much the same mistake. When we think about how we relate to God, we tend to make the same mistake. We tend to think that one identity that we have is our real identity. But there's really something else, something different, something underneath that is actually our true identity. And the problem is we live as if we are Clark Kent when we in fact are not. Today's passage is gonna confront us with the reality that we get confused about the reality of who we are and what is just a disguise. We have a false out-of-date identity that influences how we think. It influences what we care about. It influences how we relate to people and how we behave. We repeatedly struggle with sin. We repeatedly think things that we know we shouldn't think. We say things that are hurtful that we know we shouldn't say. We do things and we say to ourselves, I want to stop doing it, but we can't. Stop. Where is the victory over sin? Where is the growth? Can you relate to that? The Holy Spirit reveals a great deal about how to deal with this type of struggle in today's passage. And what we're going to see is that there's a call for us to make a clean break with a false identity. A clean break from who we used to be. And then Paul is going to describe in detail what that false identity actually looks like. And then he's going to show us the process of, of pulling off that mask and revealing who we really are in Christ. Just as a quick reminder, we won't go into as much depth. But just as a reminder, especially if you're new to the study, the book of Ephesians is divided into two sections. The first three chapters, the first half of the book is all about what God has done for us. And now we're transitioning into the second half of the book, which is how do we respond and how we live. And in chapter four, what he's going to talk about is that we must maintain unity. We are in the midst of that section right now. And we saw two weeks ago when we started chapter four, that for us to maintain unity, it starts with the character that is nurtured inside of us. And he talks about five different virtues for us to nurture. Humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another, and then eagerly pursuing the maintenance of unity. Last week, we saw that we can't develop these virtues in isolation. It takes one another. It takes the body of Christ to nurture these qualities. Passage, we're going to look at one of the main obstacles that we have in developing these qualities. And one of those obstacles, one of the critical main obstacles, is we cling to a false identity of who we are. And so the first thing Paul does in today's passage in chapter, in chapter 4, verse 17, is he exhorts us, make a clean break from the past. 
Now this I say and testify in the Lord. Now it sounds like Paul is just kind of repeating himself here. He's being redundant. But actually what he's doing is he's raising the intensity level. This word testify in the original Greek in which this was written means to insist. It means to implore. And when he says, I testify, I implore, I insist on this in the Lord, he is saying that he insists on this based on the authority of who Jesus is. If a writer of scripture says, this is something that I insist on, I implore, I plead you, and I plead with you based on the authority of who Jesus is, whatever is going to follow is going to be extremely important. And what follows is that we must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. We've seen this word walk before. It has the idea of how we live daily life. How we, how we go about just making decisions, how we go about just the stuff, the routines of life. And when he says no longer walk or no longer live, no longer do daily life as the Gentiles, he's writing as a good Jew thinking about how Jews thought of Gentiles. And the way that Jews thought of Gentiles, Gentiles were people who did not have relationship with God. They were people who lived without God. And so what he is saying is, Do not live your daily life as people who are without God, who don't know God, who don't have a relationship with God. And then what he does in these final words of 17 is he describes a little bit of what that life without God is. It's a life in futility of their minds. The word minds doesn't just refer to Being a really bright guy doesn't refer to intellect. That's part of it. But it refers to your worldview, how you perceive things. What do you think is true? What do you think is right? What do you think is good? What do you think is beautiful? And he says, in their minds, it is futile, which is a word that means literally worthless. It's meaningless. It's fruitless. So Paul is saying, Do not live any longer as people with God do, or people without God do, in a way that is a worthless guide to how you live. Now, in the past weeks, we've talked about what was the city of Ephesus like, the city that he's writing to. And we've said that it was a cultural center. There was a lot of arts there. It was a place where many talented people, brilliant people would gather. It was a financial center. It was one of the key financial hubs of that region. So it was a place that would draw and maintain people who were wealthy. It was a very important strategic spot for the Roman Empire. It was a strategic port. And so it would draw people who were very politically powerful. And these are the very sort of people you'd look at and say, their worldview, how they think, how they look at life, certainly they've got things figured out. These are talented, gifted people. They're wealthy people. They're powerful people. But Paul says because they were without God, how they think, how they understand the world is worthless. You want to see a parent? Um, It doesn't matter what the parent's personality is. doesn't matter how laid back, even keeled that parent is. You You want to have fun with a parent and watch them go ballistic? Watch them when their young child starts heading towards the street. The calmest parent in the world will act like their hair is on fire. If they have hair. They will yell. They will run. They will flap their arms. They will do whatever they can to say stop. Don't run into that street. Don't go there. And that is exactly what Paul is doing in verse 17. He is with all intensity, with all passion, with urgency, saying, stop, don't go there. I have a friend, you don't know him, doesn't live in this town. 
It's always important to say that disclaimer. Otherwise, people think, oh, you're talking about me. Uh, no, this friend um, regularly goes from job to job to job. Can't keep a job, or even if he can keep a job, he'll go ahead and quit the job anyway. He um, usually will do that just in time to slip into drugs and alcohol. Um, and in the midst of that, will cut himself off from all the people in his life who care about him, all of his friends, all of his family. And you look at a case like this, you want to just grab the guy and say, stop it. Stop what you're doing. Don't you see how this pattern of decision-making, how this pattern of, of cutting yourself off from people, of slipping into these behaviors, of, of leaving aside one job after another is destroying your life. Stop self-destructing. That is what Paul is saying. But most of our efforts at self-destruction aren't nearly as obvious as my friend. And so we have to ask the questions of ourselves. Do I, do you have Paul's urgency, have Paul's intensity when you have negative thoughts about someone else? Or do you nurture those thoughts, kind of feed them, talk to them and pet them, or just kind of help them grow? Or do you have Paul's urgency? Stop doing this. Based on the authority of Jesus, I plead you. Do you have Paul's urgency when you talk behind someone's back? Or do you never give it a second thought? You see, verse 17 should challenge us. It should challenge us to greater urgency for making a clean break from the world's way of life, from the world's way of thinking. And Paul describes the world's way of life and the world's way of thinking in very great detail, starting in verse 18. And what he's doing is he's giving us a picture of the mask, the costume that he wants us to take off. And Paul paints a very distressing picture of the lives of people without God, and he centers it around three key words. They are darkened, they are alienated, and they have become callous. Darkened, alienated, and callous. The darkened in their understanding is very similar to the futile in their minds. Understanding, again, refers to, to their worldview, but it's also their ability to comprehend the true nature of how things are and how things work. And he is saying that they are darkened, they are blind in their understanding, in their ability to comprehend the true nature of things. And if we are honest, if we stop and really think about what he is saying, that sounds crazy. You think of a guy like the guy in this picture, Stephen Hawking. And you think that the world is full of people who do not believe in God, but they comprehend the nature of things very well. Here's what Paul is saying. Look, there are people who have incredible insight into creation, but they have no insight whatsoever into the creator. And that's a huge blind spot. If you have no insight into the creator, then you don't know that creation has a purpose. You don't know that there is hope for the alienation and loneliness that you feel. You don't know that there is a right and wrong that goes beyond this moment. And even though you may not know the, the scope of right and wrong, you have this sense that you don't measure up inside of you. And you have no idea that there is any place that you can go with that. A person who does not know these fundamental truths goes through life blind. They are darkened in their understanding. The second thing they are is they are alienated from the life of God. This is God's life-giving power that they are separated from. And they are separated from it because of two things. They are ignorant. They don't know God personally. And they have hard hearts. To have a hard heart means that they don't value God. They don't make God a priority. 
heart is not just about emotions in the Bible. It's also about your values and priorities. And God to them is something that is just of no value whatsoever. So they don't know him. They are ignorant of him. And their hearts are hard. See, because they don't value God, they don't know God. And because they don't know God, they don't have God's life-giving power. The third way that he describes them is that they have become callous. This word callous means that they literally feel no pain. They just don't care. In other words, these are people who don't have a relationship with God and it just doesn't matter to them. And as a result of that, they immerse themselves into a life of self-indulgence and immorality. They have given themselves, it says, to sensuality. This is a word that means it, it doesn't live up to the standards of society. It, it doesn't live up to the accept, acceptable norms. And they are greedy to practice every kind of immaturity. They want to, they hunger for, they pursue not living out what is right and what is wrong, which is what the word impurity means there. This is a life that is completely self-centered. It is a life that is focused totally on self. And remember that when Paul writes this, he is writing to Christians. There is a danger. There's a warning in there that Paul wants us to be aware of. And that danger is that we can live just like this. We can be self-focused. I know I'm right and I'm not backing down. We can be self-indulgent. That, gospel made me, that gossip made me feel good, so it's, it's really not that bad. We can be self-absorbed. I am going to get what I want regardless of the input of the people around me. And we become just as self-focused, self-absorbed absorbed as the non-Christians around us. And what Paul is saying is when you do that, you are living as if God has no place in your life. So here's the hard question that you've got to ask of yourself. What behavior, what attitude, what thoughts do you have that you know are wrong, but you are finding a way to justify, right? You pick or create the rules that allow you to hang on to what you're trying to justify. And we have always done, we've all done that. We talk about someone behind their back. We know it's wrong, but we tell ourselves that, that we're just trying to help them out and that makes it okay. We harbor ill will towards someone and we know that it's wrong, but we just hang on to it and hang on to it. And we will not mend the relationship. And we do that because we say, look what they did to us. So it must be okay. And what Paul is saying is that you are living with a mask on. And that mask is a mask just like someone who is not a Christian. You are living as if you are Clark Kent. And that is not your real Paul urgently calls us to make a clean break from the false identity. And then he describes what that false identity looks like. And then finally, Paul closes by challenging us to replace that old life with a life that reveals who we really are. But that is not the way, Paul says, you learned Christ. What an interesting way of saying that. We usually learn information. What does it mean that we learn Christ? You remember all through the book, Paul has been talking about that we must know Christ. And he's not just talking about data. He's not just talking about facts. We must know him personally. And that's what he's doing here. He's picking up on that theme. We must know Christ personally. And verse 21 can sound... Like Paul is, is unsure if they really know Christ. But the way this is written in Greek, he's actually saying, yes, I'm assuming that it's true that you do know Christ. He is affirming that they know him personally. He is affirming that they were taught in him and that they know that truth 
is found in Christ. And then he goes on to say, and here are three things that you were taught. Three things that you know are true. And the first one that you were taught is to put off your old self. The old self is what he was talking about in verses 18 and 19. It means to get rid of the self-centeredness. Get rid of the corrupt thinking and words and behaviors. And he says we must do that because where it comes from is corruption through deceitful desires. There are wants that we have that lead us astray. We want to feel superior to someone or, or to other people in general, or we want to believe that we can have control over our lives, or we want to feel accepted more by people than by God. And Paul is saying these are corrupt desires that lead us astray. We must put them off. The second thing that he tells us to do is we must be renewed. And where we are to be renewed is in our minds. Again, how we think, our worldview. And he's got this really kind of a strange statement, in the spirit of your minds. Every time Paul uses this word spirit in the book of Ephesians, he's referring to the Holy Spirit. So I think what Paul is saying here is your thinking needs to be renewed. And the way it's renewed, how it's renewed, is through the work of the Holy Spirit. That is what Paul is seeking, is ultimately, if we're going to move from the old self to the new self, we have to have the Holy Spirit do the work of renewing, changing how we think. And there's verse 24, gives us the third thing that we are to do, is to put on the new self. We are to start living as people who were created to be like God, to live as people who are righteous and holy, people who are set apart to be distinct from the world for the sake of reflecting the character of God. We must put off the old self, have our minds renewed that we must put on a new self, a self that is like God, that is righteous and holy. What Paul is basically saying here is we need to stop living if God, like God doesn't exist. And we need to live the way we are created to live, to be just like him. And if you've been a Christian for more than, say, five minutes, you listen to everything I just said and said, yep, I get that. And the problem is, I don't have the slightest idea how to do it. Problem is, I have thoughts that I want to get rid of, but I don't know how to stop them. The problem is, I have automatic responses to people that are hurtful, and I feel horrible about it, but I don't know how to stop it. I want to, but I don't know how. I want to get rid of this old self. I want to be characterized by the new self, but I don't know how to get there. And I think this passage, if we slow down and take a look at a few key things, is really helpful. The first thing that we need to notice as we think about this passage is what Paul doesn't say. What Paul never said is, stop doing bad things, just be holy and righteous. Paul doesn't say, Here's your checklist of things that you have to do. Now just start doing those things. How often do we as parents, as teachers, tell our children, stop doing that, but we never come back and explore with them what is driving their behavior? How often do we say something mean to a friend or to our spouse, and we never examine ourselves and ask the question, why did we do that? Why did we say that? This passage is really about what is going on underneath our behavior that drives that behavior. And it gives us a lot to work with to explore what's going on underneath. Did you see how Paul describes the old self? Futility of mind. In other words, it, it's, it's just thinking a worldview that, that is worthless. 
dark understanding. They don't, they're blind to the true nature of things. They are ignorant of the person and we have of any relationship with God. I want to stop right there and make an observation. These are all about how we think. Paul continues in the passage, their heart is hard, they're calloused, they don't care, and their desires lead them into corruption. This is all about the heart, what we value. And do you see how these things work together? If you have wrong thinking, it's going to lead to wrong values and that's going to lead to wrong behaviors. If you think that God is distant, then what you're going to value above everything else will be things like hard work and talent and your experience and your intelligence. And where is that going to lead? That is going to lead to pride and looking down on people. But if you have right thinking, you say, God's grace is always at work in my life constantly. And yes, I work hard and I use all of my talents and all of my gifts. But ultimately, God gives the glory. Then what that leads to is humility and a willingness to help others. If you want to stop being condescending, if you want to stop gossiping, if you want to stop being harsh, you can't just start by saying, I'm going to stop being condescending and gossiping and harsh. You have to do that, but you also have to look at how the old self is guiding your thinking, how the old self is influencing what you value. And Paul tells us that old self has to be replaced by something new. And he describes the new self in three ways. You learned Christ, taught in Christ, and you know that the truth is in Christ. Do you get a sense that there's something being repeated here? The new self is focused on Christ. The new self knows Christ intimately. The new self knows how Christ wants us to live. The new self understands that truth is found in Christ. So how is all this relevant? How do we put this into practice? If we want to deal with sins in our life, if we want to move towards righteousness and holiness, the first thing Paul says that we need to do is we need to take off our old self. And we take off the old self by paying attention to what is going on behind the actions, behind the words, behind the attitudes. And the first thing we have to look at is, what do we want? What are we trying to accomplish? And what does that tell me about what I think is true? If I am rude to my wife, I need to stop and think to myself, what did I want? And I might discover that what I really wanted was to, for her to feel bad because I was hurting. What is the truth that I was believing in that moment? That I had the right to punish her for how I was feeling. Or maybe what she did that, that contributed to how I was feeling. Those are both wrong thinking, wrong values. I need to turn away from being rude, but I also need to say to God that what I wanted was wrong and my thinking was wrong. And when the Bible talks about that, it's talking about repenting. It's my willingness to go to God and say, what I did to my wife was wrong. But what I believed my role was in her life was wrong. And what I believed I had the right to do was wrong. And how I was thinking about her and about you was wrong. And when the Bible talks about repenting, it's saying, I am wrong and I don't want to stay there. I want to turn in a new direction. And so often we think of repenting as just being about the behavior. I was rude to my wife. But Paul is telling us that taking off the old self involves repenting not just of the behavior, but the wrong desire and the wrong thinking. What does it mean to put on the new self? It means to go in the opposite direction. 
we have to start by what is true. What is true about who Christ is? What is true about how he is at work in my life? And then based on that, what is it that I can want? What is it that is a right desire for me? And so what is true is that I am just as sinful as my wife. I am just as broken. I am just as rebellious rebellious against God as anyone else, including my wife. And I have no basis upon which I may judge. So what do I desire for her? And what do I desire for me? That we would both become more like Christ, that we would become righteous, that we would become holy. And so my response to her needs to be not rudeness, but grace and mercy, honest conversations that lead us to to understand God's grace and healing in each other's lives. And I must believe that God can work his healing and give us grace. And then I must follow Jesus. And if you're paying attention, You've heard the three big words of the Christian life. Repent, believe, follow. The Christian life is the constant daily cycle of repent, believe, follow. Put off the old self, repent. Put on the new self, believe what is true. And then become more like Christ in how you live. And the key to the whole process is right here. Having the Holy Spirit work through us as we get to know Christ better. How do we do that? How do we get to know Christ better? We spend time in scripture prayerfully. We talk to other Christians about him. We go through our day thinking about what you've learned about him. You pray for the Lord to show you more about him. You pay attention to how he is at work in your life every day. And oh, by the way, this thing that we call life groups here, that whole point of life groups is to help us do this, is to help us learn Christ better, that we may put off the old self and put on the new self. told the story at the very beginning about amazing grace. And I want to make sure that before we leave this passage, you understand something about this word right here. In the original Greek, it's really clear that this word is talking about a process over time. It is something that is going to take a lifetime as the Holy Spirit works in you to take off the old self and put on the new self. It is going to take a lifetime of repent, believe, and follow Jesus. Paul is urgent. We must make a clean break from our old selves, our old way of thinking, our old values, our old behavior, the way that we used to think, what we value, and how we acted before we knew Christ. And this happens as the Holy Spirit uncovers false thinking and false values that operate in our lives. And then the Holy Spirit goes to work on replacing those with the truth of who Christ is and what he is doing. This is how we replace a false identity with the true identity. The point of this passage, why did the Holy Spirit inspire this passage? It is to make this point. The Christian life is a life of replacing a false identity with a true identity. It's a life of replacing the old self that we used to have before we knew Christ with the new self that is now available to us in Christ. You ever thought about what would happen if Superman lived as if his true identity were Clark Kent? He would be boring. He would be a reporter. He would never know the joy and fulfillment of being who he truly was. And the world would never benefit 
from him being who he truly was. And that is the danger if we cling to the old self as our true identity. We will never know the joy and fulfillment of being who we are, and the world will never know and never experience the benefit of what God is doing through us. Paul warns us against that fate. Be urgent to see the old self replaced by the new self. Leave Clark Kent behind. How do we do that? Just a few suggestions. Again, every week, I, we value Scripture here at church, and, and we believe that as you come to grips with Scripture, it changes you, it transforms you, precisely because you get to know Christ better. And that is why I encourage you each week to, to try the discipline as we go through the book of Ephesians of taking the passage and rewriting it in your own words. It causes you to slow down and really come to grips with what is he saying here and how is it relevant to me? Pick one way this week that you want to put on the new self. What is one thing in your life that you say, I know that my values and my thinking are wrong and it's showing up in my behavior and I want to change that behavior. I want to become more like Christ in that area. Pick one thing and say, this week, I'm going to work on that. How do you work on that? Share with someone else what you're wanting to work on so they can pray with you and encourage you and give you advice so they can remind you of the truth of who Christ is in your life. And make this a matter of prayer. Go before the Holy Spirit and say, help me put on the new self. Help me renew my thinking so that my thinking is based on what is true and my values are based on what is really important. If you're someone here and, and you are just starting your journey, just thinking about a journey in relating to God and who God is, and then I want to encourage you that what this passage does is gives you hope that there, there is a way of living that is new and fresh and free that you do not experience in the old self. And if you want to know how you experience that new self, at the end of the service, please talk to one of the folks who's going to be standing up here or talk to someone who's been on stage this morning. If you're a brand new Christian, one of the most powerful things you can do in learning Christ is to learn how to read the Bible. And if you want to learn how to read the Bible, then I would encourage you on, on the tear-off that's on your bulletin, just put your name and contact information and write there, I want to learn how to read the Bible, and we will get in touch with you, and we will help you learn how to read the Bible. And you can give that to me, or there are boxes in the foyer, and you can drop those off. And we will help you to start knowing, learning Christ in an intimate way through God's word. And if you're a mature Christian, if you're someone who's been walking with Christ for years, then your job is to help others see the old self that's at work beneath their behavior and to replace it with the truth of who Christ is and how he's at work in their lives. All of us have an assignment coming out of this passage. I want us to close in prayer. And I want us to stand as we pray, and I'm going to invite the prayer team to come forward. Why is it that we need to close a message like this in prayer? Because one of the things that Paul makes so clear in this passage is that the work of renewing your mind is not something that you can do on your own by your own strength. It is a work that happens through the Holy Spirit as God is making you new. And so it is right to come to him and say, help me renew my mind. Help me live as the new self. And that can apply to any area that you're living with today. You're struggling with finances. What does it mean to think rightly, to have a renewed mind when it comes to finances, when it comes to being a parent, when it comes to being a spouse, when it comes to being a friend, when it comes to being a teenager, whatever. What does it mean to do that? That's why these folks are up here to pray with you along those lines. Let's pray. 
And Father, that is exactly why we come before you. Your word makes it clear that what you have not done is you have not just given us the Bible as a list of do's and don'ts that we have to do or to avoid and then on our own strength and on our own power work as hard as we can to live up to that standard. Lord, you are alive and at work in each one of us. You make it possible by your Holy Spirit that our thinking, our minds, our whole worldview can be renewed. You make it possible by the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives that the old corrupt way of thinking, the wrong values, the wrong behaviors that we hate can be left behind. And Lord, the way that happens is that we learn Christ. Lord, help us to do that in whatever areas we are struggling. Help us to do that today and this week. Not by our power, but by yours. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Here is what we have said about God this morning. We have said that God is at work taking the old self that you had, and he is making you new. So our challenge today is to leave here and join him in that work. Put off the old self. Put on the new. You are dismissed.